Good morning and welcome to Lincoln Hills. We are so excited that you decided to join us for worship this morning. Uh, our prayer is that you experience the love and grace of God during your time with us. I'm going to pray and then we're going to get started with worship. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here to lift your name high and to study your word. Father, we ask that you just bless this time together, that it will be edifying for us as believers, and that it will motivate us to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Hills. We are so glad that you guys uh, are joining us online today. And I just want to remind you uh, that we serve a great, big, awesome God and that he is worthy of all of our praise, of all of our worship and all of our adoration. So I just want you uh, just to join with me just as we join together as the family of God, just to lift up the praises of Jesus. Would you join me as we sing together? Through every battle every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, and you are my portion, you are my hiding place, yeah, I believe that you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe that you are the way, the truth, the life. Oh, I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take. Yeah, I believe that you are provided. You are protector, yes you are, you are the one I love, oh God, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, oh I believe you are the way, the truth, yes you are Lord, the life. I believe you are. Oh, you're faithful, God. Yes, you are. Sing to new horizon. It's a new horizon. And I'm set on you. And you meet me here today. Mercies that are new, yeah. All my fears and doubt. They all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Oh, yeah. All my fears and doubts, they all come to because they can't stay long. When I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Oh, I believe you are the way. Yes, you are, Lord. The truth, the life. It's a new horizon. Oh, I believe you are. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. Oh, yeah, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to you because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way, yeah, the truth. Oh, the life. God, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. Oh, I believe you are. Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I 
like the Lord. Sing the way. The way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe in you are. Sing your blood. Your blood is healing every wound. Your blood. Making all things new, your blood speaks a better word. See blood, your blood, the measure of my word, your blood, more than I deserve, your blood. Speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's singing out with life. It's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Sing your blood. Your blood, a robe of righteousness. Your blood, it's my hope, church. I hope in my defense. Your blood, forever, forever covers me. Oh, forever covers me. Yeah, yeah. It's seen out with light. It's shouting. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better word. It's calling, it's calling out my name. It's breaking every chain. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word, yes it does, yes it does. Oh, it's making all things right. It's breaking down the walls. Come on, church, we sing it's rewriting. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. Yes, it does. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. It's rewriting my history. It covers me with destiny. Yes, it does. It's making all things right. The precious blood of water. Oh, and it's rewriting my history. And it covers me with destiny. Yeah. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ. Singing out with light, it's shouting down the light. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. 
Oh, speaks a better word. It's calling. It's calling out my name. It's breaking every chain. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Oh, speaks a better word. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we see it's making. It's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Oh, speak to better word, yeah, yeah. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord for your blood that was shed for humanity, that the sins of the entire world, past, present, and future were laid upon your back and that you defeated death and that you conquered the grave. And wherever we're at today, as we're watching this, as we're listening to this, as we're singing along to this, we know and we believe that if we are in Christ, we stand as resurrected people because of what you accomplished, Jesus, and we can never thank you enough for that. We thank you for that pure, sinless blood that was shed for us that day that makes every wrong thing right, that washes us white as snow, that makes us pure and spotless before you, not because of anything that we bring to the table, but because of what Jesus has accomplished and so graciously poured out. God, we thank you just for the generosity that you have shown us in Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing with us today. Thank you again just for joining us online. And uh, what we're moving to in our worship service right now is something uh, known as the Lord's Supper or communion. And what that is, is a time for us just to dwell and to reflect on our relationship uh, with Christ. And we do that by taking bread and by taking juice. And these things are symbols um, of his body and his blood um, that were poured out for you and for me, that was broken for you and for me. And so here in just a second, we're gonna reflect on that and then just take those things together. My kids, they do this thing. Every week we'll ask them to go down to the basement and to get something and they will tell us no, they'll cry and say, please daddy, don't make me go into the basement. And uh, I'll go ahead and send them anyway. They'll go two at a time so they won't be as scared. But they'll go downstairs and one will usually shut the light off and run upstairs to leave the other one downstairs. Another one will cry and get upset. And uh, why are they scared of the basement? Well, because it's, it's dark. When the lights are on, they're okay, but when those lights go off, they get afraid. And a lot of us are like that, right? Like, we don't like dark. I think it's because we don't really know what's going to go on in the darkness. We cannot see. And uh, in life, sometimes it can get dark. Jesus 
was sent to take away the darkness. In John 1, 4 and 5, it says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus was sent here to die for us, to bring us out of our sinful life, to bring us out of the darkness so we can spend eternity with Him. And that's why we take communion today. We want to remember that. We want to remember what Jesus did for us. We want to remember uh, the darkness that we've been brought out of because of Him. So as we take communion today, I encourage you to remember that, to think about that, and, uh, and let that hold a, a joyful place in your heart. So let's pray together, and then we'll take the elements as a family. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. And I just thank you for dying for us. I thank you for sending your son to do that and to bring us into light. We love you. May we never forget what you've done for us. And may that hold a special place in our heart. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. His body broken for us. And his blood spilled out for us. Each week at Lincoln Hills Christian Church, we take an offering. We do that for different ministries at the church to advance the kingdom and to help people that are in need. You can go on our website at lincolnhillschristian.com forward slash give, and it will tell you the many ways that you can give. I'm going to pray for our offering. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for all the blessings that you give us. And Father, we just thank you for your presence. Father, be with us today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to another online service at the Hills. I'm so glad you joined me today in this service because uh, we are in our second sermon on vital tweaks in four weeks. Today we're going to talk about fine-tuning our resources. Now, uh, I am currently right now in my front yard. I have this big uh, river birch tree. And for years, Joyce has wanted me to build a a planter or a wall around it, a retaining wall, and then fill it with dirt and put some flowers in it. So I started doing that a couple of weeks ago, but um, it wasn't working out too good. And then uh, this past week, I had three different uh, neighbors to come and give me advice because all three of them had expertise when it came to building one of these uh, landscape block walls. So uh, Jerry came over and, and he talked to me and showed me that I was doing it all wrong. And so I started taking it all apart. And then Mark came over and he told me a little bit more about it. And so I started tweaking it or fine tuning it to, uh, to what Mark had said. And then uh, the last one to come over was Dennis. I'd never met Dennis before. And Dennis and I got to know each other, but he said, I've been watching you build this wall from my front porch up the hill. And uh, if you don't mind me butting in a little bit, I want to tell you some things that will help you. And I said, oh, no, uh, I need to learn from somebody that knows what they're doing. See, I didn't go to the Home Depot website and watch a video on how to build one of these walls. I had the blocks upside down. I didn't have my, my bottom row level and all that good stuff. So I was headed for trouble. But these three neighbors were, were invaluable to get me back on track. You see, the Bible is our major resource for maturing as disciples. Tweaking our study and spiritual growth is vital to making disciples. If I'm going to share Jesus with someone, if I'm going to share God's plan with someone, I need to have some knowledge and I need to understand that my resource for that is the Bible. Now, let me tell you a story. Karen Wells was a 14-year-old girl that I met on a weekend retreat one time. I was doing weekend retreats with the different churches almost every weekend while I was in college. And I had a team of people from other colleges that I could call in. So we showed up at this camp. And uh, the second day of camp, Karen Wells came up to me and he said, Webby, she said, you, 
do a good job. You play the guitar and sing and you speak. I've heard you speak. Uh, how would you like to, to be a speaker for my youth group? I said, well, I'd like to do that sometime. She said, no, we've got a, we've got a cruise planned and uh, we're going to the Bahamas and we need a speaker and my preacher's been looking for somebody. I'm going to tell him that you're the guy. I said, sure, kid, that'd be great. I'd love to go. Well, you know, I passed it off. That wasn't going to happen. Well, I got back to school, and Monday afternoon, I had a call. Uh, and I returned the call, and it was from the preacher at the Methodist Church in Jacksonville that Karen was a member. He said, Webby, uh, Karen Wells told me that you'd be a perfect guy to go on this, this uh, cruise with us. And so uh, all I need to know is, can you go? And I said, what are the dates? So he gave me the dates, and I said, sure, that's my spring break. I'd be glad to go. He said, well, you need your passport, and uh, uh, so you get ready, and, and here's the address of the church. Just show up on, on this morning, and we'll, uh, you'll have a good time with our teenagers. Wow, I said, you know, what, a, what an opportunity for me to do that. But here's the thing. I'm, I call my uh, the courthouse down where I grew up and where I was born in that county and they sent me my birth certificate and guess what I called my mom and I said mom there's a problem she said what I said my birth certificate has the wrong birth date on it she said it does I said yeah it's got December the 11th and I was born on the 12th that's when I've always celebrated it see I went to the source that I knew would give me the truth. My mama gave birth to me. She knew when I was born. What happened was that I was born in a doctor's office, actually, in the back room, and uh, Dr. Brown delivered many babies back there. But my, my mom came in r just before midnight having me, giving birth to me, and the nurse had been at work all day on the 11th, and when she sat down to... Uh, fill out the birth certificate she put December 11th so I went to the source because I think the source matters I would like to encourage you to fine-tune the first tweak we're going to look at today fine-tune my knowledge of the Bible I love what Paul writes to the young preacher Timothy he's he's mentoring Timothy and in second uh, Timothy three sixteen, he says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped uh, for every good work. So Paul's saying our source for the knowledge that we need for everything that has to do with us being a disciple of Jesus is in God's Word. Now there's two ways we learn about God's Word. We learn, first of all, we learn this God breathe, and that's what that's what Paul said, all scriptures God breathed. That means it's inspired by God. It's given by God. It's God's mind. And there's two ways that, that we can learn that. Uh, the first way is from professional Bible teachers. People who have studied for years, have been to Bible college. Uh, most of your staff have been to Bible college. We, we are professionals, and what makes us professionals is that you pay us to do this. We get paid for our expertise in this area. So we are here on a professional basis to <clears throat> get you to understand the Word. That's one of our roles. I went to Bible college. I've taught the Bible for years. I've been in ministry for 40 years. Uh, most of us have a lot of experience. Not only do you learn from that, but in September we're going to start our Grow You program online. We will have not only college professors, but other preachers. Uh, your own preachers, we will be bringing you Bible studies. And it, at your leisure, you can go online and you can study the Bible. And, but you're studying it with the help of an expert, you might say it that way. Uh, Grow You will begin in September, and I hope you look forward to that. Uh, Jesus appointed leadership, see, for the local church. And uh, there was a purpose behind that. The purpose is to equip the saints or the Christians in that local church so that they might be better disciple makers. Ephesians 4, 11 talks about this. It was He, talking about Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers 
to prepare, here it is, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we need someone who has studied the Bible to help us learn the Bible and to be disciple makers. The second way that we learn and we grow in Christ is from our own personal study, from observation and imitation. You see, I have a responsibility as a disciple to prepare myself. Uh, I remember Joyce and I a few weeks ago, we went uh, for her surgery in Cleveland, but we'd had a trip down for my dad's funeral. And on that trip, I noticed that we were in a lot of rain and my windshield wipers were horrible. So I thought to myself, I need to get that done before we go to Cleveland in a, in a few days. So I got home and I got the oil changed just before we left for Ohio. I did everything I needed to check the air pressure in the tires and all that. All of a sudden, we took off on our trip. It was pouring down rain. And those wipers, when I turned them on, they were horrible. And I said, you know, I missed that detail. I wanted to have good wipers because it was a possibility there would be rain. See, we have to look for the details in God's Word, and, and that's our responsibility. I remember, too, a few years ago, our dryer element went out, and without a dryer element, a heating element, the dryer is no good. And uh, I called Sears. They sent out a technician. He brought the part, and I had to pay for the part, but I had to pay $75 for him to put it in and to make the trip to my house. Well, I took him to the utility room where the dryer was. I decided before he got there, I was going to learn how to do this. So I watched him. I imitated everything he did the next time my dryer element went out. And guess what? I changed it. So I will never pay for a dryer element to be changed in my dryer again. I can do that now. I took personal responsibility to learn how to do that from an expert. See, we'll be a more defective disciple, uh, uh, an effective disciple maker when we're better prepared by our study of the Word. Now listen, the second fine tune or the second tweak I want to bring to you is this. Fine tune my, my application of God's Word. Knowledge is one thing and then using that knowledge makes that knowledge very important. Uh, if I just know it, it doesn't do me good or anybody else any good if I do not put it into practice. A disciple must correctly apply Scripture to life, their life and other people's life. In, a, in Paul's mentoring of Timothy, that young preacher, in 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul writes this, talking to Timothy, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who doesn't who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. I have some questions I want to ask you. Now, this is not to embarrass anybody. This is just simply for you to mull over and think about yourself. Now, the, the first question is, are we doing our best? And I think that's a personal, very personal question. And then I have some questions about the scriptures I want to ask you. Uh, first of all, uh, who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament? Do you know the answer to that? I know this is an online service, but think about that. Maybe talk about it uh, amongst yourselves if you're with other people. The second question is, does the Bible say that money is the root of all evil? Do you know the answer to that? Is that true or false? What is the difference between the disciple and a, an apostle? You hear those words interchange all the time. Well, what's the difference between those two? In the book of Acts, what is the significance about the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? Do you know the answer to that? Listen, can you tell someone God's plan for their salvation? Now, these are very basic questions. And if you're having trouble with those questions, then you might need to fine-tune your knowledge, but you might need to fine-tune your application of that knowledge also. Our understanding of Scripture is vital to saving souls. 
And I want to prove that to you from the scriptures. The devotion of those first disciples on the day of Pentecost, by the way, Acts 2, their devotion was instrumental or vital to the saving of souls. They didn't save them. Jesus saved them. But they were disciple makers right away. They didn't have Bibles to hand out to anybody or to read to anybody. But they devoted themselves to some things that are vitally important. When you turn to Acts 2.42, you find the first thing in that list of things they were devoted to. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. See, the apostles were teaching what Jesus told them to teach, and so they devoted themselves to that teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. We will talk about that next week in the next sermon in this series. They were devoted to the Lord's Supper, and they were devoted to prayer. And then they were unselfish. In verse 44, it tells how they were selling their lands and their possessions to help the needy. And you get down uh, to verse 47, and here's the result. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because of the lifestyle and the knowledge and the use of that knowledge, other people became Christians because those Christians were devoted to those things. The third tweak I want to remind us of today is to fine-tune our spiritual discipline in our lives. When Paul writes to Timothy... In the first letter, chapter 4, verse 8, he says to Timothy, Physical training is of some value. We all know that. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Paul's saying, you know, and I think in our 21st century, we spend a lot of time talking about our physical lives, our diets, our exercise, and those things are good. But Paul's saying you are a disciple. And if you don't tweak your discipline about your spiritual things as much as you do about your physical things, you will not be an effective disciple maker. In Luke 6, 40, the Lord says, A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. If I am striving to be more like Jesus, then I have to study on my own, but I also have to have a discipline to study God's Word and to to grow and mature as a disciple. To be like Jesus, I must study Jesus, and I must discipline myself to do God's will like Jesus. Uh, I thought about the Garden of Gethsemane, that night that Jesus was arrested and then He was headed to the cross. And he was in anguish over the physical pain that he would would be enduring uh, when he was nailed to the cross. He knew what that was about. I want to call this comment garden gravitas. Gravitas is a great sounding word, but it's, it's about seriousness and the importance of manner. It is about causing feelings of respect and trust in other people. What did Jesus ask God? Is there any way, Father that this cup can pass from me. Is there any other way we could accomplish your plan? Then he resigned himself to say, Father, it's not my will to be done, it's your will to be done. He was disciplined enough in his mission to do God's will and to go to the cross. See, a mature disciple studies, learns, and applies. When it comes to being disciples who make disciples, we must grow up. It's like humans, you know. Uh, To remain a baby in a grown-up body, that's abnormal. But to remain a baby Christian as a disciple of Jesus, we're on an adult mission, and to remain a baby, that wouldn't be good. We must become adult in our knowledge and in our discipline and our learning. It's so important. I love the litany of things in Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. And this is, uh, this is something you could write down and put on your refrigerator or in your car somewhere and look at it often. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In other words, go to the Scriptures. 
Don't, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Sometimes we get too big for our britches, so to speak. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Just reading that will remind us that being a disciple of Jesus is a very important thing for us to learn and to grow in because then we can make a disciple. Uh, I mentioned my birth certificate a while ago uh, when I was talking about going on a cruise with a group of teenagers. But listen, uh, I, I want to remind you that my birth certificate was, was really important to me because it proves when I was born, or almost proves when I was born, it was wrong. But I have another certificate with me today. This is my baptismal certificate. And in my baptismal certificate, it says that, uh, of course, it gives my birth date, December 12, 1947, and that's the right date. But it says on March 4, 1974, I was reborn because I was obedient in Christian baptism. Now, when I thought about that, I thought about the, the importance of studying the Scriptures and knowing the Scriptures. I grew up in a great church. I grew up with parents that loved me. They took me when I was a little baby before the church. The preacher... Uh, read scripture I'm sure the congregation might have done responsive reading but I was sprinkled as a baby and in that sprinkling the preacher my parents and all the people in the church considered that my baptism I learned when I was uh, in 1974 that Christian baptism is by immersion did I repent of my sins no I was a baby I'm not sure I had any sin. I was tiny. Uh, did I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior? No, I didn't do that. Uh, somebody did that for me or decided that. You see where I'm going with this? Having a relationship with Jesus Christ biblically is very important, but it's also very personal. God calls the person who is able to understand His Word and to follow His Word and to obey His Word to be one of His disciples. He calls anybody who will. And so when I was a baby, I loved all of my, as I grew up in my church, I loved all my teachers, my, my people in my church. They're great people. They love Jesus and, and so did I. But I was introduced to the scriptures that actually were specific about baptism. And I obeyed in Christian baptism. So I was born again according to Scripture. See, that's what's vitally important. If we're going to be disciple makers, we need to know exactly what to tell people that the Bible teaches. It's about what God's Word teaches, not about what I think. So I'm praying that as you fine-tune your disciple life, that you fine-tune it, in the respect that you will discipline yourself, that you will tweak, you will fine-tune your maturity by getting into this Word, getting help when you need it to understand it, but also digging these Scriptures, reading these Scriptures, and finding out for yourself what God's will is for your life. I thank you for listening to this sermon today. See, we're talking about fine-tuning our discipleship. And next week we will talk about relationships because that's so important to who we are, not only as a human being, but as a Christian. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We ask, Lord, that you would bless uh, these words that's been spoken, that this time that we've spent together, that this word would be fruitful in our lives, that we will take to heart and to life the things that uh, will enhance and help us to mature as Christians. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for loving us in Him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to bear. 
What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Because we do not care, we think to God in prayer. See, have we tried? Have we tried your sentence? trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share Knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Oh, what a friend we found! What a friend we found! What a friend we found in. Oh, what a friend we found! What a friend we found What a friend we found in Jesus 